No one knew how alone I was feeling And the emptiness I tried so hard to hide Though I laughed and said my life was fine without you I was covering up the secret tears I cried Then one day someone told me of your mercies And the love you showed on a hill called Calvary There you died and purchased my redemption when you broke sin's power and set my spirit free I'm amazed that you love me I'm amazed how you care Through your precious blood I found pardon my sins, my sins are washed, are washed, they're all washed away. Oh, my sins are washed away. Yes, it's true. There have been days when I failed you. Lord, you know how many times I have gone astray. But I have learned your love is stronger than my weakness. And your ear is open every time I pray. No one else could ever care for me like you, Lord. Other friends could never be so close to me I'm not afraid to face the problems of tomorrow Knowing you are everything I'll ever need I'm amazed that you loved me I'm amazed how you care through your precious blood I found pardon and my sins, my sins are washed, are washed. They're all washed away oh my sins are washed away I'm amazed that you love me I'm amazed how you care Through your precious blood I found pardon And my sins, my sins are washed, washed They're all washed away Oh, my sins are washed away quite an ensemble they have just sung for us again the blessed gospel the good news of Jesus Christ we need Christ because of our sin we all are sinners Romans 3 23 and we need Christ and not someone or something else for only Christ died for us only Christ was buried only Christ rose again from the grave only Christ ascended on high only Christ is poised and ready to return 
can't tell you how important it is that you know him, that you have a personal relationship with the one and only Savior from your sin. May God do that great work in your heart even this hour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We are so privileged now to be able to open up the pages of your book. And of course, as we do, it matters not where we turn. We have long ago come to recognize that we really are listening to and hanging on every one of the words of the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the very moment that we mention him, we are first of all reminded of the blessed gospel, the good news. The bad news is we are sinners, and our sin very effectively separates us from God, not only in this life, but worse in the life to come. But the good news, oh, we are amazed at how you love us. The good news is, God, that you sent your Son. The good news is, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to come. And you actually took my place on Calvary's cross, and not my place alone, but the place of every man, woman, and young person. You died for the world. Amazing. You took our place. Amazing. You bore the penalty of our sins so that we wouldn't have to. Amazing. And the Bible is explicitly clear that this seeking and saving God offers us salvation from sin as a gift too precious to be earned, only to be received. And God, for those of us who have received, what lives then should we be living and for those who have not yet trusted Christ, that today would be the day. We have in our hands and hopefully in our hearts the words of life. May the Holy Spirit of God turn the light on. Once again for us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. We are nearing the end of our systematic, expositional, exegetical study of Paul's epistle to young Pastor Titus. We come this morning to the last section of the book. I'm referring to Titus chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. And as you would expect, our having read this for our scripture reading this morning, we will need a couple, two, three sessions here, in part because of the goodly number of people, places, and things that Paul alludes to. And of course, because Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, being born along by the Spirit, if you will, thank you, Peter. And because such inspiration is verbal and plenary, then you and I are interested in every word. If it drops from the anthropomorphic lips of God, we want to hear In fact, our heart cry is deeper than that, again, in part because of James' teaching, which is our Sunday evening study, where we desire to not be just hearers of the word, but doers also, that we wouldn't just hang on every one of God's words, hear them, but that we would allow the Spirit of God to apply such truth to our hearts, which means, in turn, that we will indeed be doers and not hearers only. The challenge is great for God's people, but we have every motivation to go and to be and and to do all that God wants us to. Our prayer is that God would help us to finish our study well. You know I always wonder this. You remember one of the first things we said at the beginning of our study. Well, maybe you don't. It was probably a few years ago. You know, I wonder if we're going to complete the study. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Oh God, may we finish the study well. 
Paul writes in verse 12 the following, take a look. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. God is going to, my heart and head is full, and I don't always handle that well, as you know. God is going to impress upon us many things here. In, in verse 12 and these precious verses which are before us, but before we look a little closer, I want you to note with me all of the movement. We, we sometimes read over uh, very significant things. You can't read verse 12 apart from being impressed with all of the movement on the part of a number of people. Paul intends to send Artemis or Tychicus to Titus, who is, as you know, ministering on the Mediterranean island of Crete, and he's ministering to a whole collection of local churches there. We don't know exactly where the Apostle Paul is, for he is writing this epistle on the move, but what we do know is that he's in the process of um, traveling through Asia Minor, which is the western end of modern-day Turkey. And we also know from our text that he's heading to Nicopolis, which is a Grecian city in the province of Macedonia. When either Artemis or Tychicus gets to Crete, one of them, whoever Paul ends up sending, is to relieve Titus. And then Titus, of course, is to... Meet Paul in Nicopolis. I almost brought my G.I. Joes and was going to try to show you all of the movement of the men. I would dove this moving, all of it, as ministry moves. Moves that are inseparably linked to ministry. And as I note that with you, you can hear the inherent challenge. One of the things that's readily on our hearts and minds, and you certainly would readily recognize and agree with me, is that we are constantly on the move. By the way, even some of us old-timers that don't move very well any longer, we still do an awful lot of movement, and I was thinking somewhat humorously even this morning that if we had some time-lapse photography going on in regard to our day, you'd be surprised at how much movement you make. You really are a lot busier than you think. We make big moves like from city to city or bigger from state to state or bigger still from country to country, like our beloved missionaries, the Cuthberts. We have a myriad of many moves that make up even a single day. Even those of you that are somewhat confined to an office, i.e. you're spending a good bulk of your day behind a desk, it's amazing all of the movement that makes up your life. Many moves, we would say. Like from your house to the grocery store, from your house to school, or to your place of employment, or to your neighbor's house, you name it, etc., and etc. And here's the challenge, if you would walk with me through it, that we Ought to, I, I think there's a call here on the part of God, a, 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 a divine challenge that is issued inherent, of what, inherent in what we just observed. If you and I would group together all of our movements, and you can think about a single day or a week or a month or a year, I, that'd be hard, obviously, to do such, the greater the time span, but in regard to our lives, if we could somehow group together all of our movements, the, the question would be how many of them would qualify as being ministry moves? What percentage 
of your and my almost constant movement would fall under the category be linked, inseparably linked to ministry, where ministry was your intent, where the movement was prompted by and or accompanied by the prodding of the Holy Spirit of God and by prayer. See, if you've come that far with me, then you'll also be interested in embracing the, the, the call of God on our lives here because I believe it's time once again for us to cast a renewed vision in regard to all of the movements that make up our lives. And to see with God's help that more and more of those movements would be inseparably linked to ministry. Where we go, this sounds almost ridiculous. The worldling would have no understanding of this, but where we would go, even to the grocery store, even to the grocery store, ministry minded. Like the sign that used to be on the door as you exited the church, you are now entering the mission field. Where the difficult grind of working day after day and multiple hours of every single week in the workplace, perhaps in a factory, all of a sudden God once again turns the light on and you see it's a mission field that you actually go for that day, not so much for the money, but for the mission. Looking to be a minister. Your intent is ministry. Oh, that all of our moves were animated by the Holy Spirit of God. And oh, that we would be on a quest for that to be a reality. I don't know that anybody, including the great Apostle Paul, would make a claim in this realm. But oh, that even today, you and I would leave with a stronger determination to cooperate with the Holy Spirit of God who has tabernacled in our hearts since the moment we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, daily moved by him, controlled, Ephesians 5.18, by the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, that we would be like the Apostle Paul and like some of the men that are mentioned in our text, always, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 58, right? Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord and for the Lord is not in vain. Every time I read that verse, by the way, don't you just want to go boing, 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 boing? Oh, God. That we'd be boinging. For the Lord Jesus Christ. That we'd be a people down to the last one that are ministry minded. Viewing every arena of our lives as the mission field. I don't know, we may have just touched on the secret to Paul's success. And the success of many of God's people down through the ages. We may have just noted what foundationally lies at the, the lives of missionaries like the Cuthberts who for many, many, many years, yea, decades, expend themselves in ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's begin to take a closer look. Paul, at the beginning of verse 12, mentions by name two men, Artemis and, and Tychicus, one of whom was about to be sent. I, the, 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 ah, there, there's drama here. It's actually, it's neat. I, ah, 
we, we, we sometimes misread God's word. We sometimes miss the passion. We sometimes miss the inner workings. We sometimes miss the drama. Exciting verse 12. And I'm so thankful, by the way, because there's other places where we have been and where we certainly could turn, where, where, where Paul in his, writer, in his writing, writing under inspiration of the Spirit of God, would be referencing someone and actually warning us about them. But to come to a verse and to hover over and to be introduced to people that Obviously, not only know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, but are passionate about ministry, that the movement that they make, sure shoot, and it's going to be somehow linked to ministry, is exciting. And, and, and Paul, you can tell that he's going to be practicing what he preaches here because he absolutely needs uh, wisdom from on high. He absolutely needs the guiding of the Holy Spirit of God, so much so that he actually reveals to us that he doesn't know for sure. And of course, circumstances actually do come into play with this. He doesn't know for sure whether he's going to be able to send Artemis or Tychicus. Even that is exciting. I guess I'm proving to you again that it doesn't take much for Pastor Tom to get excited. Artemis is so very interesting. We have not even a tidbit of personal information. We have a name. This is the only place that he's referred to in Scripture, and you'll be interested in this one commentator that I hold in high regard. Simply and succinctly states, and I quote, We know nothing about Artemis. So thank you, you're dismissed. <laughs> I'm not being smarty aleck, and I'm certainly not proposing that I've seen something that uh, other people haven't seen. I am not that foolish. But in light of the normal approach to such things in regard to commentaries and they are valuable to us, but we need to keep them in proper perspective, that's for sure. And I think some of this will warrant that. And in, in light of uh, the fact that most everybody just mentions his name and moves on, having recognized that we know nothing of the man, my initial approach to this would, was going to be the simply skip over Artemis, but then, and I suppose you won't be surprised by this, the Holy Spirit of God hindered me in doing so. Wait just a minute. Wait a minute. Wait just a minute. You're wondering how many times I'm going to say that, right? As long as I have you, I'm going to keep saying it. And I had you for three. Wait. Just a minute. The Apostle Paul is about to send Artemis to relieve Titus, who has an absolutely strategic and crucial and island wide ministry in a collection of churches. Wait just a minute. It's the great apostle Paul who's about to send Artemis. You know, Paul, the, the one who was so passionate about the things of God, the things of Christ, you know Paul, who at every turn champion the blessed gospel the good news of Jesus Christ you know Paul who at every turn championed the inscripturated word of God even as the canon of scripture was being compiled you know the great apostle Paul who at every turn championed truth over that which is false warning at every turn against 
false teaching and their false teachers. Hey, wait a minute. We actually know quite a bit about Artemis. In fact, somebody ought to write a book. He was a man of the gospel. He was a man of the word. He was a man of uncompromising conviction. He was a man of deep devotion and deep commitment. He was a skilled and gifted minister. Write a book. For the Apostle Paul is about to send him to Crete. What a man. Almost like this, and God, please understand my heart and sentiment in regard to this. I love the fact that God spells everything out in his word. I love the fact that we come across various characters where there's a significant narrative that unfolds, and we just eat that up. It's kind of like a kid in a candy shop kind of thing, and thank you, God. But don't you love the fact that God sometimes doesn't even give us the name of the man? Don't you love the fact that God sometimes gives us a name but nothing else? But when you take a look at it, and again, this is, this is basic hermeneutics, right? When you take a look at it within context, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God does indeed turn the light on. And before too long, you see yourself rightfully so writing the, a, a book about a godly man. Artemis, who would have ever guessed? I have two concluding questions. Don't shut your Bible. Don't turn your heart and mind off. Because the conclusion is going to last about 45 minutes. One question for the Christian. Be clear, a Christian is someone who's put their faith and trust in Christ. Been confronted with their sin, which the word of God does. Yow. There, once again, the Holy Spirit of God turns the light on and we see the gravity of our sins. Part of the reason why the ensemble played and sung with passion morning amazed at at God's love why because we are sinners and you know this our sin very effectively separates us from God we're in a peck of trouble and then came Jesus And he lived a perfect life on this life, a life that you and I did not and could not live. He offered himself as a perfect sacrifice on Calvary's cross. He died for it. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. Christian. Those of you that have seen your sin and then seen the Lord Jesus Christ and cried out in faith and received the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, that kind of Christian. Saved. 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 One question for the Christian, one for the non Christian. Christian, Christian, I wonder if the Apostle Paul would have considered sending you. I wonder if the great Apostle Paul would have considered sending me. 
Now, don't fall into the Moses trap, Exodus 3 and 4, right? Don't, don't begin to start offering your excuses before you even hear fully the call of God on your life. Don't in your humanness, and I would say even further in your carnality, and perhaps in even further in, in our sinfulness, don't eliminate yourself from a ministry by beginning to offer what Moses did initially after he received the clarion call of God on his life. And it is amazing to me how that we, and, and, and please again see our carnality in this, it is amazing to me how that before we think about anything else, we instantaneously start thinking about gifts, we instantaneously start thinking about abilities, we instantaneously start thinking about skills, and one of the first things out of our hearts, if not off from our lips, is that, God, I don't have the goods. Let me ask you a question. Are you a man, a woman, a young person of the gospel? Can you be? Must we not be? Do you know and love the gospel? Can you and I be men, women, young people of the word? Can we know God? Can we be knowing God? Can it be an active and passionate thing that we're actually pursuing God? Kind of like the heart who thirsts after the water brick brook on a daily basis can we be pursuing God in his word can we be knowing him better every day can we through such study arrive at a place where we are men women and even young people thank you thank you Young people, those of you that actually have convictions based upon what you know to be true of God and the inscripturated word of God. Can we be men and women and young people of uncompromising conviction? Can we take our stand? Can we teach and preach and live the truth? I tell you, you know, this is so appropriate that we would recognize this. We, we, we ought to be in training. We ought to be developing skills. We ought to be diligent students. We ought to be taking advantage of everything that, that God has made available to us. But the fact of the matter is we have the gospel. We have the inscripturated word of God. It paves the way for each and every one of God's people to be living their lives based upon uncompromising conviction. You and I can and should and must be devoted, can and should and must be committed. And you know what God does with men, women, and young people like that? He sends them. He uses them. I wonder what God does with a ministry-minded, servant-hearted man. I wonder what he does with a ministry-minded woman, ministry-minded young person. Would the apostle Paul thought of you and me? Would he have considered sending? us. Christian, that's your question. I have a question for what I might call the non-Christian. You are here this morning or within the sound of this voice and you have not yet put your personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. Your question. Why were the people that we have in our text so passionate about Christ. Why were these people, many people, so ministry-minded? Why is it that these men and in the greater scheme of things, women and young people, why is it that they more and more are seeing the different activities in the various arenas of their life as being inseparably linked to ministry? Why is it that they are seeking with both lip and life to set forth 
right. Why in the world would capable men and women like Alan and Robin expend themselves for 35 years for the cause of Christ. Ah, you're going to be surprised at the simplicity of the answer. It is because Christ has saved See, they, like the rest of us, were on the road to eternal loss and ruin, Matthew 7, 13. They were condemned by their sin, John 3, 18. And then they met Jesus. They met the Master. They met the one and only Savior. They met the only begotten Son of God. They met the God-man, having taken on flesh in point in time. So that he, God, why have you given me, Christ speaking, God, why have you given me a body so that you can die in it? Christ willingly and gladly took on that body so that he could actually suffer and die, shedding his blood on Calvary's cross again in our place. It isn't just that he died. He died for me. He died for you. He took our place so that we wouldn't have to bear the penalty, not of his sin, he had none, but ours. Why would anybody expend their lives for Christ? It is because he saved them. Listen, non-Christian, this is the greatest thing in all of life. Finally seeing and embracing God's one and only solution for your sin. It's not complicated. Thank you, God, for the blessed simplicity. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Please, please consider him this morning. Please, if you have not yet, put your faith and trust in him. Please, if you have not called upon the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13, if you haven't believed and if you haven't received, plead with you to do that even in the quietness of this moment. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment. Again, child of God, the Spirit of God doesn't want to lose you, as it were. You have your question and your commission. But in the end, we are concluding with a word to those who have not yet put their faith and trust in Christ. I, I restate by way of emphasis all the blessed simplicity of the blessed gospel. It really is as simple as this. Oh, listen, it's part of a high calling, and you've heard us say, if you've been around, you've heard us say it many times, salvation isn't the end, but the beginning of a great adventure with great challenges indeed, but also with great reward. But oh, it begins with you almost like a child, right? putting your faith and trust in Christ. You say, Pastor Tom, I I, I desire to receive Christ today. How can I do that? Well, pray this prayer with me, would you please? I I don't mind, even if you pray it out loud, that would be kind of interesting, but you don't have to. You can pray pray it in the recesses, quiet recesses of your own heart. Lord Jesus, in the end, I've been prompted to think of you, to consider you. I've been reminded of the fact that I'm a sinner, And that the effect of my sin on my life is that it separates me from you, not only in this life, but the life to come. But I've also been reminded of, yea, I rejoice in the fact that there's a Savior, only one, only one who took my place on Calvary's cross, only one who bore the penalty of my sin, only one who was buried, only one who rose again from the grave so that he could offer to me, the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life in heaven as my eternal home. And this morning, I pray to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. I won't belabor this, but your heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You prayed that prayer this morning. I'd love to know. I'm not going to run back and tackle you unless you desire that. You can let me know. I'm not going to run back and tackle you. 
I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you, but boy, I'd love to know that you prayed that prayer and you're beginning this great adventure of knowing and now loving and serving and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you prayed that prayer and you want me to know, would you raise your hand? I'll acknowledge your hand's been raised. You can place it right back down after I do that. You prayed that prayer this morning. You want me to know. Again, for many, many who will be listening to this message through our DVD ministry and web and everything else. Listen, God will honor his word and know this, that when you, when you recognize your sin and by faith pray to receive Christ as your own personal Savior, that God does exactly what he said he would do. He, he saves you. He makes you a part of his family and gives you forgiveness and actually makes you a new creature, right? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Oh. It's the best of news. Trust you. Trust you have trusted him. Heavenly Father, impress these things upon our hearts. Thank you for your word. Thank you for its vitality. Thank you, God, for its challenge. Thank you, Lord, that you've not only given us your word, but you've also given us your spirit. And as we've noted a number of times this morning, he not only helps us to understand, but he is the power in, in our applying the truth to our lives. And for those of us that know you, may we leave this place this morning with a renewed vision of the call of Christ on our lives, entering the mission field. I pray this in Jesus' matchless name. There is good news. Jesus saves. Let's turn over there. 667, six, singing the first verse of Jesus saves. As you turn there, a reminder to the accompanists of our brief meeting over in the overflow. Standing together, 667. We have heard joyful sound Jesus says Jesus says spread the tidings all around Jesus says Jesus says bear the news to every land cross the seas and cross the waves onward tis the Lord's commands Jesus says Pastor Rick McClendon will close us in a word of prayer. Brother Rick. Heavenly Father, as we think about this message, there's a song that John W. Peterson had written, and it says, So send I you, so send I you to bear my cross with patience, and then one day with joy to lay it down, to hear my voice, well done, my faithful servant. Come share my throne, my kingdom, and my crown. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. What precious words we have from Jesus that says, so send I you. The privilege that you've given to us to, uh, in everyday activities, for us to be a, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, to have that excitement, to have that uh, thrill and and uh, be empowered by you to share the word of God with a uh, world that is dying. Heavenly Father, as Pastor mentioned uh, and brought forth uh, powerfully at the end of the message, there may be someone here that is a non-believer, someone who has never trusted Jesus Christ and, and may be wondering why Christians, many Christians, are excited to serve you. And I pray that they may uh, soon realize their necessity to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and that they too would be then empowered to go about wanting to serve you 
I pray that that would be each one of our testimonies. Help, help us to shed ourselves, uh, repent of our sin, and, and to uh, renew our hearts and minds so that we may be great servants for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.